morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the second of uh, the town hall meetings to discuss the uh, revised constitution uh, that uh, we're going to develop uh, and have a constitutional convention uh, the 13th, uh, 17th, and 18th of this month. I hope everybody will attend. We're here to hear testimony from people that want to comment on the draft constitution. I hope everybody has a copy of this. If you don't, uh, certainly they are available. Um, we have two more of these forms coming up. If you want to further participate or get uh, let your friends and neighbors know that they should participate. Uh, on June 7th, we'll be at the uh, African American Civil War Museum and that's at 1925 Vermont Avenue. It's really Vermont and, and U Street. Uh, and then uh, on the 8th, the very next day, we'll be at Raymond Recreation Center, which is at uh, 3725 10th Street Northwest. And these are flyers that are available. You can pick one up at the end of the day so that you don't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, my name is Michael Brown. I am one of your two uh, United States Senators elected in the District of Columbia, like all other Senators, but not allowed to serve. Uh, and that's really why we're here. We're here to uh, make sure that in the future, uh, the District of Columbia becomes a 51st state so that you will have representation in both houses of Congress, uh, autonomy over your budget and your legal system. Um, I will tell you that the process is going slowly, but what we're attempting to do is we're attempting to put a referendum on the ballot which would affirm our desire in the District of Columbia to become the 51st state. This is a great idea. It's actually a departure from what we've done in the past. Uh, it's making a demand on Congress and, and, and putting Congress in the position of deciding one way or the other whether you're going to accommodate us or not. Uh, it will not bring us statehood. You should understand that. It's a, it's a matter of getting the issue out there and uh, bring it before Congress. Only Congress can grant us statehood. But this is, uh, I think, a noble effort. Uh, we want to make sure this referendum passes uh, by as large a majority as possible. So we encourage all of you to get involved, not only in the Constitution process, but also in the rest of the process. Uh, I've been joined by my colleague, the senior senator from the District of Columbia, Paul Strauss, and I'm sure Senator Strauss wants to make some opening comments. Thank you, Senator Brown. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, we on the commission are excited to hear from as many members of the public as we can about this process. We want to make this constitutional convention the most inclusive ever in the history of the United States. Uh, so we are traveling all around the city. Uh, literally every resident of the District of Columbia is a potential delegate to this constitutional convention. And I really want to hear uh, from uh, the members of the public that uh, signed up to testify today. Uh, it's important that this process be as inclusive as possible. This is a draft document, uh, but it is subject to amendment based on all of the comments that we hope to receive. So uh, with that, I understand that we have um, some members of our legal committee here. I see Fred Cook just uh, walked in. Um, and uh, I know we have some members of the public that have signed up to, to testify. I believe you have the, the witness list. Yes, I do. And and at this point, we have two witnesses. So so please, if you wanna if you wanna join us, uh, uh, you know, sign up, and we'll we'll we're glad to hear. We want to hear from as many people as we possibly can. You, you want to have the legal team. Uh, uh, Mr. Cook, did members of your team want to make any opening remarks and present the document uh, before we hear from public testimony, or do you want to hear from the public witnesses first? Uh, I don't think so. I can't speak for everybody, but I don't think so. Uh, we're happy to speak. And, and, uh, well, let's, let's, 
Let, let's have you come up at least so that. Uh, sure. Well, you can. Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever, whatever makes you whatever, comfortable. Yeah. Uh, well, why, why don't we? We have one camera here. I know it's recording sure. this for posterity, but all right. Right. Just for the record, my name is Fred Cook. I'm a lawyer here in the city, and I'm part of the um, statehood committee. Um, Commission legal team, and uh, a couple members uh, of the others of the team are here, and we're available to answer questions and to help move the process forward as best we can. Uh, and I think it's probably more important to hear from the citizens than to hear from us. But uh, to the extent the citizens have questions, we're happy to try to be as responsive as we can be. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. And I know I speak for Senator Strauss in saying, Mr. Cook, that we appreciate your service and the service of everybody on the committee. You guys are doing a great job, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, should we call the first witness? Uh, Laura Fuchs? You out there? You want to? Hi, Laura. Welcome. So I like your t-shirt. I don't have like a written testimony today. Okay. Um, I will in the future, but okay. I don't understand how this works. Um, so my name is Laura Fuchs. I'm a resident of Ward 5. I've been in D.C. for the past nine years. I teach AP government and D.C. history at H.D. Woodson Senior High in Ward 7 for the past nine years. My kids will be here at the next two, um, but I figured I'd check it out first so we knew how it worked um, so I can prep them a little bit. I did have several questions, and I don't know who's best to answer them. Um, main ones are going to be around education and the Bill of Rights. Okay. So... When I was looking at it, I was really confused when I opened up the draft document and it opened with the National Bill of Rights, um, especially including parts that are unincorporated. Um, most state constitutions, to me, it would seem, have stronger Bill of Rights than the National one, because the National one is a pretty weak uh, document in a lot of ways. Um, and I know that we have a Bill of Rights, and so one of my concerns was that, while maybe that's not a perfect document, it protects more people than the current Bill of Rights does. And I don't want it to be by law that we create protected classes. I want it to be in our Constitution. So I did have a lot of questions about that in particular, um, especially regarding the right to an education, which we don't have in DC currently, which I think we'd want to use this as an opportunity to make sure our students do, in fact, have a right to an education, not just not to be discriminated from an education, which is important, but a positive right to an education. So. I think there's opportunities here that I hope we can kind of take up on, and I'm interested in hearing what the procedure is going to be for offering amendments and who gets to do that and how they're approved and that whole, like how we amend the document. So I am really interested in hearing about that as it comes up. Um, I also had questions around the State Board of Education in particular. Being a teacher, it's very important to me. And one of the things I noticed was that there's kind of two parts about powers. And part two refers, it was confusing to me, um, which is why I have questions. So when you look at what could be, what powers could be returned to the state board, um, it says that, and this is on page 52, um, such policies shall not include policies that were not subject to the approval of the State Board of Education for the District of Columbia that existed immediately prior to the effective date of this constitution. What this kind of reads to me is that a back door for the mayoral control, which I think is still being questioned by the community. And if we're not allowed to restore former powers like ever in the constitution, then we couldn't necessarily return from mayoral control. And I don't know that that's appropriate to have in the constitution. And I'm not sure if that was the intent, but I'm worried that when we read it, and right now the state board does not have the powers that it used to have, that that could then be used to enshrine mayoral control into a constitutional document, which I find to be inappropriate since that was done by, like, by law, by act. Okay. L let me try and respond to some of these things. First of all, you use the word mayoral control, which by definition would become a non-issue once we become a state. Uh, because we will no longer have a mayor unless we decide well, later on to set, governor up, to, to set up a, a mayor for uh, minor municipalities or, or, or other parts of the District of Columbia. That being said, um, the Constitution for the first time makes the State Board of Education a constitutional office as opposed to a creation of statute. Uh, I think that is an important step towards empowering it and recognizing it. Um, and there are a lot of things that we potentially could do uh, in this document. Uh, you know, one of our earlier constitutions guaranteed everybody a right to a job. 
Uh, we certainly have the power to perhaps make education a constitutional right as opposed to something that we provide by law. Uh, but the current thinking is that we want a document that is uh, as simple as possible, designed to, uh, we're not unmindful that this is a petition and a document that's going to be faced uh, with, with a potentially hostile Congress. And the goal here is to not necessarily get into or arbitrate disputes between the executive branches, the legislative branches, and other institutions of our state government. But the most important thing we need to do is get rid of the intrusions that come from a federal government uh, I our, our colonial status. I certainly respect that. I just think that most states do have stronger state bill of rights than the national one, and I don't see why we need to have the lowest level of rights of anyone else, like from our own government. Like a bill of rights is incredibly important, and I think we should be modeling it off other state constitutions, not the national in this case. Other than the right to education, what other rights do you think we would need to add? Well, I think when we're looking at DCs, there's a lot of protected classes that I do believe it is important to protect at a higher level. Um, and while the DC Bill of Rights is, I think, kind of strangely worded in some ways, um, I think it's just like... I mean, so I didn't come prepared like with Virginia and Maryland's or other states that I really admire, but I think there are states that have pretty strong, I mean, state constitutions and state bill of rights that aren't just a direct model of the national. And I mean, again, we're including stuff that is not incorporated by the courts, which would mean that we would have to do things that other states just don't have to do um, unless they're in their state constitutions as well. Well, let me also say that, um, uh, Ms. Fuchs, that um, um, uh, Senator Strauss wasn't at the last meeting because he had a conflict, but this is an issue that's come up time and time again. I'm sure. I saw so it in the public gonna, comments. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to, it's something that we're going to have to address. Uh, and as far as the procedure for amendments goes, that's another issue that's come up time and time again, and we're going to have to address, and, and that hasn't been addressed yet. And, and we're going to, as it stands now, the Constitution is going to be uh, decided upon by the five people that are supposed to be sitting up here right now. So um, uh, that, is a, that is an issue that needs to be addressed. And my recollection, and you have to, you, you have to take this with a grain of salt because my recollector is not as good as it used to be, but there was a guarantee of an education in the first Constitution that we passed in 1982 that was passed by the people of the District of Columbia. So. It's reasonable to put that back in, I think. Thank you. Uh, any members of the legal team? I see we've also been joined by Betsy Cavendish as well. Uh, thank you for being here. Anybody wish to uh, uh, address that at this point? Yes, thank you. And thanks for teaching our kids. As the parent of three kids that have gone through the D.C. public school system, thank you so much. All of my kids here. Okay, and we're available to make personal appearances in uh, high school classrooms as well. Uh, or at least I am. I shouldn't speak to the other members of the commission. Uh, James Buchanan, or Mr. Buchanan, are you here? Would you like to testify, please? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, I should go by J.D. Buchanan. Okay. Uh, I've been a resident for nine years, which makes my wife and I some of the newer people in town. <laughs> Um, but we really love it here, and when this came up, the chance to participate was too much to pass up. It's historic. Right. So I'm on the Ollie Ward Committee. My wife is on the Communications Committee. So we're, we're trying to do our part. So I've got a few just comments. Uh, my last one's the most important one. You already touched on it. Um, but I did find a couple places that the wording is confusing. And I think that's probably because it is legalese, which is not my field. Oh my As an engineer, I like things straightforward, um, that kind of stuff. But it was kind of confusing in the qualifications for holding offices, that bullet number four, which is the holds no other office other than places where they're compensated not in excess of their actual expenses, except if they're on a convention selecting a president or vice president. That is a very wordy chunk, and it, it's there, and I think also in the governor's section. But it's, it's just if for... If you could just cite to a page and say... Yeah, page 31, section three, bullet four. I mean, it's a long bullet. It actually goes on to the next page. Anyways, there's a whole lot of sub pieces in there. 
-hmm. And it'd be nice to know what that actually really means. And I just think it means you can't be doing something else, but there's a whole lot of exceptions in there. Um, so as I don't necessarily need an answer today, but for the legal team, just know that that's hard for just the general citizen to discern what that means. Now, most of them are probably not going to be delegates that are planning to also run for office, so it's probably not a big deal, but mm -hmm. it was unclear. Uh, going forward, in the judicial part, on page 56, section 5, they talk about the designation of a chief judge, but they never define what a chief judge is doing or what his powers are different than any of the other judges or why we even have them. And I'm guessing that's because it's modeled on the current system and there are some authority or powers in that individual. It would, I would think a sentence or two of why is that person more special than anyone else uh, should be made clear. On the submission of the budget, um, it's not clear that it'll be made available to the public prior to the board voting on it. it even uh, it does seem like if a budget is being passed around, it'd be nice for us to be able to talk to our delegates and say, hey, we like this or we don't. Um, I don't know if that's something common in other places, but it does seem with our elected officials and the fact that this is our government, we should have the ability to take our time to look at it if we should so choose. And then the last one, which was the important one, which is the amendment process. Um, right now, the amendment is only allowed by an act passed by affirmative vote of the members of the House of Delegates and ratified by the majority of the qualified voters. Um, it doesn't seem like there could be a citizen-initiated amendment process. And that, to me, seems like a big weakness. And the reason why I think that is so important right now is because I completely understand this Constitution is written to be similar to how our state or our city works right now, to make it as easy to pass. Totally understand that. But we then have to wait for our delegates to, to do things, and it, there needs to be a way for the public to do that. You're telling us to trust us on certain things, like if we go to bicameral, hey, we can amend that and change that once we're a state. Totally understand that. But if the citizenry can't initiate an amendment in the change process, that trust me means a lot less. Because then we're saying, okay, we're going to take the people, we're going to make them delegates, and then once they decide to, could potentially reduce their power or something like that. So that seems like a weakness. And maybe that's the discussions you guys have already had or things that have already been brought up. It, it is actually something that's been brought up. We haven't had the discussion, but I agree with you. I think we should be able to amend by referendum and by other means mm -hmm. as well. Let, let me ask uh, some of the members of the legal team here. The initiative process uh, is in this Constitution, and that in and of itself creates an act, as I understand it. Um, does the current language allow for the, the initiative process to propose an, uh, an amendment? It does not. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I think, I, I think that is a, uh, I thank you for raising that point. Um, in terms of the, the, the qualifications for office, um, I, as I read it, and um, I, I have some experience with legalese, <laughs> uh, you get to hold one office at a time. So you can't be in both the legislative and the executive branch. Okay. Uh, and you also can't be an employee of the government and then a member of, which would make you by definition a member of the executive branch and then also serve in the legislature. Uh, and there's a specific carve out exception for elected offices, which is delegates to the party conventions. Not every uh, territory okay. or jurisdiction elects their delegates to the convention. Some are appointed by the party, but to the extent that that is defined as an elected office, uh, the idea was to make that a, uh, a special carve out. Um, so I, I it, it, at least to, to other okay. lawyers, the section seems clear enough. Okay. But I, I agree that we can try and make this language, uh, if, if we can, so, more transparent. So it sounds like what you're saying is, if you look at bullet four, holds no other public office right. is really what it's saying. Okay. Right. You, you get to hold one public office at a time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep, that's all I had. Okay. So. Well, thank you. Thank you for so, your input. And thanks for serving our two committees. Thank, thank your you. wife on our behalf. Yep. It's great. Right there. <laughs> right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Did
do, do we have anybody else that wants to testify? Come on, Senator Strauss and I got all dressed up and we came out. We know that there's no, no. Okay, yes, please. I have a question. I just have one question. Is it okay for me yep, to say Please. Okay. I'm going to give the interpreter the microphone. Okay, I live in uh, D.C. in Ward 6, and I'm um, also a, a traveling certified interpreter, and I've visited several places in D.C., and I've already met the mayor of D.C., and I know that they've changed it, but it's no longer, but I'm still going to be paying taxes here. That's the first question. I'm still going to be paying taxes once we become statehood. And then the other thing is what type of uh, deaf and hard of hearing children, for example, the Kendall School and the Models School for the DC, uh, they'll be able to go to Kendall School and also for the Model Secondary School for the Deaf, which is right there. So I'm wondering what the plans are for the state once we become statehood, how those schools will be funded. Uh, I don't know the answer to your second question. Your first question is, yes, you will still be taxed. You know the old adage that there's two things in life you can't avoid, and that's death and taxes. So, uh, yeah, you'll still be taxed in the District of Columbia. Uh, as far as your second question goes, I just don't know the answer to that. But, but I encourage you to stay involved in the process because these are the types of things that we need to consider as we step forward into statehood. And, and I think it's a reasonable thing to ask, and I think that uh, we need to find an answer to that. But we have a comment from our legal counsel. Mr. Cook? Sure. Uh, I think the answer to the question Fred, about schools... Fred, Fred, if we could just ask you to... Um, okay. I think the answer to the question about schools uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing and how they might be funded None of that will change under the Constitution. Uh, once we become a state, uh, the funding mechanisms for those schools will remain largely the same and will be funded uh, as they are, are now. So those schools should continue in operation. I don't see any um, thing in the Constitution that would change that in any way, shape, fashion, or form. So the only real change is that right now Congress interferes with our educational policy they have used their oversight power over the District of Columbia to interfere when we try and educate our children as we decide here. What we want to do is get Congress out of that local process and return it to the citizens here in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well No other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, um, and uh, I think this uh, concludes our. Uh, what? what? I, I have more, but I don't want to. Go ahead. Well, well, we, we, uh, I didn't want to just like try on other people. We'll give you one more turn. Come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Since, since Mike did get all dressed up, I did. I at least put on a clean shirt. I ironed my own tie. It's a big day. Um, I guess some of my questions are going to be about communication, like how we are communicating about the document. Um, and also maybe kind of like, so like, for example, like the Federalist Papers, right? They're a really great set of documents that really explain a lot of the rationale and reasoning. Um, that might be very helpful. Um, from either the legal team or the group who wrote it to get some reasoning behind some of this that we could read easily online because I definitely searched the whole website. I couldn't find the names of the people who had written the document. I couldn't, you know, find contact information of who I could contact specifically about this document. A lot of it was about communication, how I could join the different committees that communicate, um, but not so much about this document itself, which, I mean, just I guess as a government teacher, I'm pretty obsessed with. So, like, I... I think it'd behoove to the public to like provide maybe some of that background and the thought process 
um, sure. and maybe some of the discussions from that committee, like minutes or something let, like that, that may be really helpful. Let, let me, uh, the, the reason nobody's name is on this document as the author of it is because we're all writing this document. So you're helping to write it by being here today. Uh, we're, we're all going to have our part to play. And at the end of the day, um, it, it's, it's going well, to maybe be like a, a point of contact well. then? Uh, like a, the point like of contact for the commission uh, is one, there are five commissioners. So starting with uh -huh. the executive branch uh, representative, the legislative branch is representative, and the three of us in the statehood delegation, uh, you have uh, five points of contact, all of which have uh, staff that are ready to, to, to work on that. There's a specific email address that's been designated, statehood at dc.gov. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the comment section and mm -hmm. uh, is essentially a point of uh, contact. And I know there's a phone number on the website that's answered yeah. by a live person between uh, okay. most normal business hours. So I encourage you to use all of that. Um, but I think the process has been explained and, and we'll try and explain it again is something had to come as an initial draft. Uh, we have three working documents that were the source of it. One is our existing home rule charter that is our governmental mm -hmm. structure. One was the document that was written in 1982. Yep. And then one was the amended document that was written in 1987. And the document before you represents uh, a version incorporating points from all three of those. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bill of Rights that you mentioned comes essentially from the 1987. Uh, and it's in there because we needed to start somewhere. We we didn't it, we wouldn't have wanted to start with I a blank slate. I understand, slate. and I appreciate that. I think it was just like when I was kind of doing my initial exploration, like it was mm -hmm. hard to figure out how like to to really get in on this. Like I wanted to be on the working group on this document, and I guess right as you're saying, like that's that's going to be these meetings. So you, I understand. You're 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 here. You are. I got you. Working, um, <laughs> you are working on the document right now with us. And, and so I guess like part of the reason I want some explanation is that some of the goals stated are goals I absolutely agree with and what we want to achieve with the Constitution, but I'm concerned that this document is not strong enough to achieve them in terms of especially holding elected leaders accountable beyond a recall and election process and kind of a commitment to the community. Because I think especially in the land of education, right now the power is vested in an executive office, be it a governor or mayor, and that we're being shut out of that process and that I think if we had some constitutional protections to having a voice in our government and how things are being done in the city that people would feel a lot um, that maybe our elected politicians would feel a lot more like they need to answer to the public because right now we've re-elected a mayor several times and yet some for some reason they don't seem interested in talking to us ever despite the fact that they keep losing re-election ever since mayoral control was put on the education system. And so I think, you know, this is a chance for this document to hold the government accountable to the people. And we want to make sure, and if I see more of the reasoning behind it, maybe I would find more of those instances. But when I was reading it, I was struggling beyond election and recall to see how we can hold our elected officials accountable to the people and making sure they do communicate and address the people. Let, well, let, let me uh, try and address that. Here, here's what this process is going to do, and here's what this process is not going to do. This process is designed to solve the biggest problem we have, is that our elected officials are not accountable only to us, but are accountable to members of Congress elected by other people. First, foremost, that is the biggest problem that we as citizens of the District of Columbia face. And we need to have a united front against our federal oversight that is proven time and time again not to have the best interests of the people here at heart. Uh, and when we solve that problem, we can begin to move on to the other problems. What this process will not be and really cannot be uh, is an attempt to resolve the fights we within our own community may have with our own elected officials, within our own competing interests. Uh, it, that's not going to work. This is not the opportunity to solve our problems as DC residents that we may or may not perceive we have with our own elected government. This is a goal uh, to get us our own elected government. And once we've done that, once we've gotten rid of the 535 uh, unelected city council members, wannabe mayors, uh, you know, drop in ANC commissioners, whatever you want to call them, uh, we can begin to solve those other problems. So but you're if kind we, of suggesting that we need to kind of go with an initial draft that maybe isn't as strong as we would like, but then the whole goal would be to be amending it like crazy once we are a state? Well, I don't, I don't know that we're going to need to be amending it like crazy, but we have, for example, an amendment process that requires a simple majority, not necessarily a two-thirds majority. Uh, 
getting rid of Congress is something that we in 200 years have not yet been able to do. Uh, and we're going to take our best shot at it that we've had in a long time with this. Uh, but we do know that the 1982 Constitution, a document that should have been a vehicle for moving us forward, turned out, in fact, to be an obstacle to that process. For good reasons, bad reasons, uh, it's not for us to say, but we know that in 1987, uh, that Constitution was such an obstacle that our own legislature uh, felt that they had to change it through a less than democratic process. We don't want this document to be anything less than a reflection of a open, transparent, democratic process. Uh, but if you have an issue with uh, the mayor, well, look, under statehood, there won't be a mayor. Uh, we don't know who the governor is going to be. We don't know who these members of the delegates are going to be. Uh, but we do know that once we have a governor and we have these delegates, that they will no longer have to worry about congressional interference. Uh, and that is uh, the preeminent goal. It is a worthy goal. And it is really our most important goal. And so while, yes, one could perhaps take the opportunity to expand the relationship that the elected government will have with its citizens. It's really a moot discussion until we get to the point that our unelected government, that is to say Congress, unelected by us, is out of our governing structure. So until then, uh, these are, are academic discussions. And, and I, for one, want to make sure that whatever document we end up with, although it reflects the broadest citizen input, uh, is a vehicle that uh, move statehood forward and doesn't slow it down. You know, I would just add to that, I agree with Senator Strauss that we have to keep our eyes on the prize here, which is to get this referendum on the ballot and get it passed and make a demand. The Tennessee plan, which we're trying to implement, is a little different than the, the tactics we've used in the past. And it is a, a direct approach to Congress. So I think we have to keep our eye on that. But since I'm only half a politician and I'm half an activist, let me say that I think that you bring up some very important points. Politicians live in the gray area, so we like to write things loosely. I think it's important to have your input and to have you stay engaged, uh, but to remember, as Senator Strauss points out, that we will be able to amend the Constitution, and several people have already asked that part of the Constitution would be a mandate to have a constitutional convention within two years of passage so that we could elect delegates and go through the process the way it's traditionally gone through. And I think that would be a wonderful idea. Okay. Thank you. If there are no more public comments, uh, on behalf of the commission, I'd like to thank everybody who came out today. Um, one of the... Uh, uh, I, I think the fact that uh, these meetings may get shorter and shorter is actually a sign of our success because we are creating a process where many people have many opportunities to comment. Uh, and so I, for one, am, am glad to see that uh, so many people have already been able to participate online in some of the other forums, um, that uh, it's uh, a, a good sign to see that this process is moving forward with such uh, uh, citizen engagement.